So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, very good. Uh, thank you. Welcome uh, on uh, our common meeting of in the group um, for uh, climate change, biodiversity, and sustainable development, and Club of Rome. And uh, last but not least, the panelist Graham Maxton, Club of Rome. Please, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm very grateful to Mark and his um, National Association for giving me the chance to come and join you today so that I can correct at least one misunderstanding. The, the Limits to Growth, which was published in 1972 and is perhaps the most famous report of the Club of Rome, is not a book about economic growth. It's not a, that we're against economic growth. The book is about ecological growth about the growth in the ecological footprint. And that's what we have to control. I'll come back to this again at the end of my comments, but we can have as much growth as we like. But what we cannot have is growth in the ecological footprint. The Limits of Growth contains 12 scenarios for the future. And the main one, the third one, uh, it was called the Standard Run, showed that if we carried on growing our use of resources and carried on increasing our population, at the rate that we were doing in the early 1970s, then by around 2030, we would have system collapse. We would have a collapse in the economic system and a collapse in the ecological system. Now, we've gone back every 10 years or so, and we've looked at the study, and we've tracked each of the measures that were used at MIT, and we're tracking exactly as was predicted in that model. So we're heading towards this collapse. Now, I would argue that the signs of that collapse are already with us, that the system is beginning to fray apart. Today, we live as if we have one and a half planet Earths. We're using resources at a rate of one and a half planet Earths. So we clearly need to knock our resource use back down to some sort of level to make it in harmony with nature. That doesn't mean we have to reduce the rate of economic growth. It means we have to reduce the rate of resource use. The consequences of what we're doing are already becoming very clear. Climate change is the most obvious and by far the most urgent. I'll come back to this again in the, in, towards the end. But the migration crisis that we're seeing from Africa, the problems that we're seeing in Syria, the problems indeed that we're seeing in Greece and Spain and Portugal, the political crises that we're seeing around the world, Brexit, Trump, the problems that we're seeing in France and other parts of the world, these are all signals that the system is beginning to fray apart. They're all signs that the economic system is not functioning properly. The poverty, the pollution, the inequality, they're all part of the same problem. Why do we have these problems? Why have we got into this situation? There are really two reasons. The first is the economic system. The economic model that's dominant today requires us to grow every year. We have to increase the throughput of resources so that we can produce more, so that we can sell more, so that GDP can go up. Now, to increase GDP means we have to increase resource use, which means we have to increase energy use, and that creates more CO2, which creates climate change. So the desire for economic growth is the direct cause of climate change. The other main reason that we're in this mess is population. As has been mentioned several times already, we're today at 7.6 billion people. 2011, 7 billion. We're still increasing by nearly 100 million a year. And that's a phenomenal number that we're trying to absorb. And it means that a lot of the problem is still in the pipeline because these people still haven't reached, most of the people in the world haven't reached their maximum use of resources yet. So a lot of the problem is still ahead of us. Why do we not act, and why has the Club of Rome failed in the last 45 years to get people to understand this? I think there are, there are a number of reasons, but, but one of the first ones is vested interests. There are a lot of people, the 1% who are very rich, who do not want this system to change. There's a question of timing. When Limits to Growth was published in 1972, it was too early. People still thought that there was unlimited possibilities. I think the timing is better now, and I think people are beginning to listen to our message much more now. There's still a great lack of understanding. 
and particularly about the urgency of the situation. I'll come back to that at the end. We seem to think that we can make this transition over decades. We can't. We have to make these changes much faster than that. There's a question of cost. It's going to cost more to do things right, and we want to do everything on the cheap. So we have to accept that to do things properly and sustainably is going to cost us more. And finally, there's a natural inertia. People don't like change, and they don't like shifting to a system that they're not sure about, and they'd rather stick with something they know, even if it's going to kill them. What do we not need? We don't need technology. When I give talks around the world, one of the questions that's always asked is, surely we need to invent something. We can, we can suck the carbon out of the atmosphere. It's a question of new technology to find people, jobs for people. We don't need any technology. We have all the technology we need to shift to a no-carbon economy. It's just that it's going to cost more, and we're not willing to pay for it. So it's a question of political will. It's a question of us making up our mind to change the system. And what we do not need are market-based solutions. The free market is the cause of this problem. It is the cause of a system that creates a, this desire to grow the economy every year, which then creates the problem of pollution and CO2 and climate change. So what do we need to do? The solutions vary by regions of the world. And if, it, if I look at the European Union, you don't need any economic growth. I mean, you can have it if you want, but you don't need any economic growth. If you take the GDP of Europe and divide it by the population, there is already sufficient income, wealth, and output for everyone. The problem is one of distribution. It is very unevenly distributed. Some people are rich and some people are poor, and some people are extremely rich. So we have to have a system that gradually redistributes income and wealth and work over perhaps 20 years so that the system can adjust, which allows everybody to have a decent standard of living. We don't need to increase output. We have sufficient already. Now, we need different solutions for the, for the poor world, but in the rich world, it's a question of distribution. And we can distribute without a great deal of difficulty by increasing vacation time, for example, as the French have tried and many other places have tried to do. Uh, we can provide a basic income for those who need it. Now, our calculations show that we can't provide it for everybody, but you can provide it for the elderly, the sick, and the unemployed. We can tax resource use much more. We can tax the dead. There are ways of redistributing wealth and income which can shift us to a more sustainable pathway and change values over perhaps a couple of decades. GDP is a measure of value. If I put a zero on the end of every price, I can increase the GDP of Europe tenfold without changing anything at all. So GDP and the idea of economic growth is, 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 a, is a way of confusing us, really. What we must not do is increase the ecological footprint. So we need a transition, a transition to a fairer, more evenly balanced society. Just coming back to my other point about urgency. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing by two or three parts per million a year right now. It's at about 406 parts per million. Now, if it reaches 450 parts per million, then the two-degree increase in average temperatures becomes inevitable. Now, it's not difficult mathematics. If it's increasing exponentially at two or three parts per million a year, we've got about 20 years. We've got about 20 years before that border is passed, and we make a two degree centigrade increase in global average temperatures a certainty. It won't happen in 20 years because there's a lag in the system. It'll happen about 10 years later. But we've got 20 years to stop pumping carbon into the atmosphere. Now, when I give talks around the world, the, the, the region that understands these issues better than anywhere else is Europe and the EU. And so this is why I was so keen to come here today. The EU can lead in this discussion, can lead in its environmental policies, and it can lead in realizing that we must reduce the ecological footprint and we can have as much growth as we like. Thank you very much.